As believers, we trust God because we know he's going to come through for us. But sometimes we have to wait. So what do we do while we're waiting? What do we do in the meantime? Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. Aren't you glad we don't have to be perfect? <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I appreciate our musicians, the work they put in, and uh, we're blessed around here to have them uh, leading us. And I'll be talking a little bit about singing along with them here in just a little bit. But last week, we, we started a series that we just called, we're just calling Messed Up. I was trying to think of some great name to describe everything that's going on in everybody's life in the world right now, and Messed Up just kind of fits, right? And uh, so... Um, and, and we talked last week, and we, we, we said that, um, honestly, this is nothing new. I know everybody that goes through something, they think they're going through it worse than everybody else ever has, or every time is worse than uh, any other time, but, um, but it's really nothing new, and we went back to some times in Scripture, and we're going to go uh, back to that reference again today, but tough times are normal. Uh, you read history like I do, and, and very... Um, little time, if any, in history around the world has there not been conflict and uh, people fighting each other and people taking from each other. Um, on a personal level, you know, we all make mistakes and we do things that cost us. We have to deal with the consequences of it many times. Other times, we have things done to us. But again, we still have to deal with the uh, consequences of those. I used to tell my kids when they were growing up, they always wanted, they said, well, that's not fair. And I always used to remind them that the fair only comes once a year. Uh, and, you know, I say, you missed it. It was last month, you know, so, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to happen for us, and, and even to people in the Bible. And, uh, you know, you think about some of the people in the Bible, and we kind of look at them like they were superheroes, but every one of them's life was at a time of conflict and, and stuff that was going on. And so we kind of got into uh, this guy named Paul, who was a follower of, of Jesus Christ, didn't start out that way later in life became a follower of Jesus Christ. And I guess if you were to take the Bible, a lot of Bible scholars would say that other than Jesus, Paul was like the epitome. You know, I mean, if you wanted to say what's a Christian like, you would go to Paul. And, and for instance, you may or, might, may or may not know this, 27 books in the New Testament, Paul wrote 13 of them. 13, half the New Testament, pretty much. He, would, uh, he left Jerusalem. He would travel around, all around the Mediterranean Rim, and he'd get to a city, and he'd find these little groups of Jesus followers, and he would start churches, and then as he would move ahead, he would write letters back, and that's where we get a lot of our New Testament, some of the letters, including the letters to a group of believers in a town called Philippi, which is in modern-day Greece, a very important city uh, at the time back then. But, uh, but Paul is the kind of guy. So he starts all these churches who say, wow, he's this great guy. He's writing the Bible. And this is this amazing guy. But the story we read last week said that, uh, that this, made, this made people angry and, and they, uh, they came after him and they arrested him with a bunch of false accusations. They put him on a ship. And they're going to send him to, to trial in Rome, which is you know hundreds of miles away. Uh, ships, not the most comfortable, not like cruise ships or stuff today, but he's sailing to Rome for trial. Big storm comes up on the Mediterranean Sea. He's shipwrecked, uh, lands up on an island with a bunch of people, says, I'll help him. I'll start a fire so they can be warm. And he's gathering the sticks and lights the fire. And a snake that's been in there comes out and bites him. Uh, so he's stuck on the island, you know, snake bit, not feeling very good, I'm sure. Finally gets, uh, they're able to get away from the, uh, rescued from the island. And he gets to Rome and he's waiting for his trial, and they said, well, we, it's so backed up, it's going to be two years. So he's got all of this stuff going on. When we, when we find him today, he's been in prison for about two years after all this stuff that's going on. And I got to thinking, you know, if, if they ask you, if they ever ask you to tell your life story, you don't want to be the person that goes up after Paul. <laughs> you know, I would just get up and say, never mind, nothing's happened in my life because, you know, this was just crazy. And, and we know that at the end of the trial, he was taken outside of Jerusalem and he was beheaded uh, for his faith. But while he was in prison, he wrote some letters. And um, from his letters, and one in particular, we can learn what to do. As I talked about in our intro, we know God's going to come through, but what about until then? 
What are we supposed to do? And he's going to talk specifically today about what to do until then and, and even tell us how to pray uh, until then. Um, I, I think prayer, and, and usually every other year I do a, a, a series on prayer. I think prayer is, is huge. I think one of the things that uh, was amazing to me is the, the guys as they were following, and I'm off script for a little bit, Kyler, I'll get back to it, um, is, is you would have... Um, these guys that were following Jesus around and they watched him heal people who had been crippled or they watched him heal blind people or they you know, watched him walk on water and all this. And, and yet what, he, what they said to him when they talked to him, they said, would you teach us how to pray? They didn't say teach us how to walk on water. Teach us how to, they said teach us how to pray. And, and, and so they saw the power of prayer and the power that it had in the life of our Savior. So Paul's going to write this letter. What do you do in these times of uncertainty? Obviously, he was uncertain. He didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, he's writing to a group of people who uh, are in very uncertain times. In the Roman Empire, back then, it was against the law to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and you never knew the next knock on the door or the next person who came up to you was going to be a Roman, you know, someone who would judge or a soldier or something and take you away and, um, and put you in prison for being a believer. So last week, we ended up, and I told you to think about this this week. Last week, we ended up, and Paul said this, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And um, I told you to really kind of think about what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Um, if, I if you were just to tell me, and I wouldn't want you because it would make us all miserable if all you guys came and told me all your problems, and I just said, hey, rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> you, you would roll your eyes and you would give me that sign. You'd say, I'm never coming to you for any kind of advice. We mean rejoice in the Lord always. Didn't you listen to me? And, uh, you know, so we read this, and there's a temptation for us today to, to read where he says rejoice in the Lord always. We're saying, Paul, this is 2024. You have no idea, <laughs> you know, what's going on today. You think you had it bad. You don't, you don't have any idea. Uh, but he put those three little words in there, in the Lord. And I challenged you last week to try and dwell on that, try and think about that. What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? We know what it means to rejoice. And so I think one way that would help us is if we do it this way. What if we take in the Lord out? Okay? Most of us could answer this. There's things that we rejoice in. We would totally get this. Some of you have a new job. I'm rejoicing in my new job. I'm rejoicing in my vehicle. I'm rejoicing in the place I get to live. A student might say, I made good grades. I'm rejoicing in my good grades. I'm rejoicing in that I have good health. I have great relationships. I have money in the bank. You know, if you filled it in with all of those, it makes perfect sense. You know, none of, nobody would roll their eyes and say, oh, Jerry, you don't know what you're talking about. Those are great things, all right? Makes perfect sense. All of us know what, it, what it's like to rejoice in something. It, it means to focus on that good news to the point where the emotion associated with that good news just kind of washes over it and people see it in us, you know? You, you, any of those things I mentioned, people say, hey, you know, you look good. Good stuff's happening, huh? You, you know, look like you got good news. And people say, what are you so happy about? And you tell them. So we know what that means. And hear what Paul is saying within the Lord. He says, I want you to spend whatever time, that emotion that went into that thing that you would put in that place or that person, I want you to put that emotion into the fact that God is a God of grace and mercy and love in your life. In other words, in what God has already done for it. He says, I want you to stop and I want you to allow the reality of what God has done for you to, 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 to impact you emotionally. And he talks about this. He talks about reflecting on God's goodness and his grace and mercy. And I think this is so important for, for we as Americans because for we as Americans, uh, we don't stop to rejoice in the Lord because we have so many other things to rejoice in. So many other things to rejoice in. And, and even just watching the news, and I know there's all kind of bad news and we don't like to watch it, but, but sometimes you got to realize that as other countries go through things, they don't go through them the way that Americans would go through them because we have things. They don't, you know? We have things that, that, that they don't have. We have cars and stuff and so many other things that capture all of our joy and capture all of our emotions. But the danger is as things get harder, as circumstances in your life get a little tougher and harder and there's fewer things and circumstances to rejoice about, Paul says, well, maybe this is a good reminder to reel in some of that and put your focus on the thing that should really give you joy, the thing that you should really rejoice in, all right? This is why, by the way, we sing together. I, uh, I love the singing part of our service. I couldn't get up here and do what I do if we didn't sing first. 
Uh, if you're one of the few pe or the people that sit along the back, you're unfortunate enough, you can probably hear me singing. Uh, <laughs> I like to sing loud. We, when I go to concerts, my wife, she always says, you're going to sing real loud, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm going to be that guy. Uh, but but I, I enjoy singing. Sometimes I even hit the right note. And, uh, you, you know, that's kind of fun. But, but we love to sing here at our gatherings, the, the RISE service that we're going to have in a couple weeks, just two weeks from now at the Brandon Center. Uh, we're bringing in other church choirs. We're bringing in some other, and, and we're going to, it's going to be like 90% singing. And, and so if you, you know, if you don't like to sing, I know some of you love to sing. Um, I know some of you love to listen to other people sing. Um, I'm fully aware that it's possible. You know, we say we sing, we worship. I think it's fully possible to listen to someone else sing and worship along with them. I think it's fully capable of, of reading the words that are on the screen. And as those words touch your heart that you're worshiping and that those words become more than just words, but they become a, a prayer. But we love to sing. Uh, uh, around here, and, and some of you maybe at an earlier time in your life, you were told by someone that you needed to listen and not sing. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Maybe that's why you, you don't like to sing. Someone told you not to. Uh, but the reason we sing about these things, about there are things we can't do, but we know a God who can. And, and the reason why we sing about grace, grace, amazing grace from the heart of our Savior. Uh, you, you know, re reason why we sing these things is... Is, is because music, the great thing about music is it's emotional. It's emotional. It affects our emotions. There, there's some of you, if you hear a certain song, you're taken back to a place, aren't you? And, and you remember that. And, and it might even get, I was watching, a, it was something on, on PBS one night, and it was like a, a, a Beatles show, and some guys were, were, not the Beatles, obviously, but someone else doing it. And they showed the audience, and there was just this guy, older guy, probably my age, out in the audience, and he was just singing and just crying, just sobbing. And I told Carol, I said, he's remembering something. That's impacting his emotions, and, and music does that to you. It's something that it does. And it's an so when we sing together, it's an emotional expression of God's goodness and grace. That's why we sing the kind of songs we do. I like upbeat songs, okay? Um, I, I don't like to do funerals, and I don't like funeral music. And so uh, we're going to sing about the Lord and his goodness. We're it's why we applaud at the end of a song, because we say, yes, we agree. We, 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 that, that was something good. It affected our... That's why when we have our baptismal service at the beach and people come up out of the water, that's why we all cheer. And that's why we all applaud because we love to see God at work in people's lives. We love to see it work in ours. He says that uh, the, the, the gentleness and uh, character and kindness, you know, he, he speaks, he says, don't let hard times begin to erode your integrity and your character. All right? You know, your character is what's on the inside, this goodness of God that's there. Don't let things that you have no control over begin to tear that away from you. I wrote in here, don't allow your fuse to get so short because things are tough that you begin to destroy and blow up the relationships around you with people that really matter. Um, and I found this true, and you guys could all stand up here and teach this part. Uh, if your joy is only associated with good circumstances, then when those times and circumstances erode, so will your character. And so will your joy, all right? You'll become short-tempered and more difficult to live with, and your face will even give you away. Um, you know anybody like that? Face gives them away? Yeah, right? So listen, finish this section with this. Your character is the result of what God has done inside of you, that work he's done inside of your life. So don't allow outside circumstances to begin to take over that, to begin to erode that, all right? Paul says, let your gentleness... Let your kindness be evident. People go, yeah, I get it. I watch her. I watch him. I get it. Okay? Again, for most of us, sadly, I know it is for me, our kindness is typically a result of our circumstances. If life is kind to me, then I'm kind back to life. If someone is kind to me, then I'm kind back to them. Um, I think it's funny. I, there have been times when I've, I don't know whether you've noticed, it, you go to restaurants and you, you get to watch people. And, uh, you know, he'll be this whole family or it might just be a couple and they're kind of fussing, you know, and, you know, keep your voice down. Or the parents are getting on the kids or the kids are getting on the parents or whatever. And, and, and they're just uh, like, and then like the, the, the waiter or the server comes up and they're like, hello, uh, would you, you know, <laughs> it's just really weird uh, what this does. In other words, we, we, we play off of kindness. And, and our kindness sometimes is a result of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And sometimes we use that as an excuse to be unkind to people. Well, you know, somebody yelled at me today or somebody got on me today. And so the next three people, 
you know, better move and, you know, kind of get out of the way. Here's what Paul is saying. He says, do not allow something that you have no control over, which is your circumstances, to take control of your character, which is supposed to be a reflection of God's grace inside of you. And this is this next part. I'm really going to have to lean on Paul here uh, because I've been pastoring for, you know, years now. And, and you guys, I know stuff and, you know, people share prayer requests with me or they say, hey, would you pray about this? Or I know stuff that's going on in your life and, um, and, and this. And because of that, it would be very hard for me to just get up here and announce on Sunday what, he, what Paul says here. He, he writes to these people who he knows are going under tough circumstances. And he begins this next part. He says, do not be anxious. Don't worry. And again, if you came to me and, and went through 30 minutes or whatever, and I just smiled and said, don't worry about it. <laughs> again, you know, the, the eye roll, the never coming back to this guy again. Um, he just says, do not be anxious um, about anything, he says. Do not be anxious about anything. And, and let's be honest. Would you agree with me? That's not very helpful advice. If he left it there, that, that doesn't do any of us any good. Doesn't do me any good. Don't be anxious about anything. It's not very helpful advice. In fact, you don't want to hear that. And, and if, you know, when someone says that, well, just don't worry about it. Our temptation would be, like, wow, I never thought of that. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> if I had only known that, you know, that kind of thing. And I said last week, there's even a song, right? Don't worry, be happy. And, you know, just silly little thing. Uh, but actually, you wouldn't tell that person, thank you. You'd say, hey, you don't have a clue. You have no idea what's going on. If you heard my sad story, you'd be as worried as I am. So Paul here, he says, he says don't, don't be anxious about anything. But here's the brilliance of Paul over me. He's smart enough to know you can't just leave it there. You can't just leave it there. And in the next two verses, he gives us the key about how do we handle these difficult times. What do we do in the meantime while we're waiting for God to come through? What do we do in the meantime? He's going to give you and I a solution or, if you will, a prescription. In fact, I'm going to give you a prescription and, and a little homework to do um, on this. But he's going to give us a prescription. Here's what you do in these times of extraordinary anxiety and times when things are so uncertain and so unpredictable that we want to tend to kind of curl up, you know, inside. In our character, we notice our character begins to erode and we worry about everything all of the time. So Paul is wise enough. He doesn't say, don't worry about it. He doesn't say, you know, let it go. He says this. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Check this out. He says, but in everything, in everything. Now, um, again, I, I told you several weeks ago, I went to Bible college, seminary. I took Greek. Um, I can, you can give me a Greek New Testament and, and given the right amount of time. I've been out of college a long time. I can figure out exactly what that Greek word means. So I, I didn't do that, I, but I, I did go to, a, a, there's a thing called a lexicon, and it's kind of a dictionary going back and forth. And so I, I, I looked the word up, the word everything up in, in Greek, and here's what it means. It means everything. <laughs> okay, and I say that because if you're like me, when I hear God say, hey, in everything, I think, yeah, but not in this. Maybe in this other 90%, but not in this. I got to hang on. I got to worry about this. I got to do this. I got to take care of this. It says in everything, in your marriage, your finances, in your health, in your job circumstance, in your school situation, in everything. And Paul says what I'm about to share with you, this group of believers in Philippi, it is so appropriate. It can be shared in every situation, right? So everybody perked up. Everybody said, man, this is, this is for me. And he says, here's what you need to replace that worry with. In other words, every time you are overwhelmed with that worry and every time you get overwhelmed and every time you start to go under because of those circumstances, he says, here's what I want you to do instead. That's what I want you to do instead. So, 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 so here's where he's going to go with this. He, he goes down uh, and he, if we just stop and read, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything pray, again, that doesn't really help, okay? I could ask personal testimony, just people I know in this room that say, have you prayed about that? And say, are you kidding? That's all I pray about. Nothing yet, nothing yet, you know? And maybe some of you have been there. We pray about stuff and it just doesn't seem God's time. You know, we know God's listening. We know he's gonna come through, but nothing's happening, 
okay? So if all we read that as is do not be anxious for anything, but in everything pray, we miss the meaning of it. We miss the meaning of it, all right? But that's how most of us read. That's how I, I, I read it. And, and so we kind of keep going and nothing happens and we get frustrated and we, we pray and, or I'll say, hey, have you prayed? And you'll say, what do you think I've been doing? You know, I pray all the time and, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, save me. Oh, God, send me or send somebody or send something. And I mean, Jerry, if you're telling me that the answer to all of the anxiety and worry is just to pray, again, not helpful at all. But like I said, Paul is a lot wiser than I am. So I want us to look at this verse again, and he uses some prayer words. He uses words like prayer and petition and request and all of this, but there's another word, I think, that, that kind of jumps out at us that we, we don't think about, and I, again, have to share with you what it means. He, he puts the word that we are to present a request to God. That word present, make a present of, to give to someone, okay, something that you have. Again, the word present there literally means to reveal something. And it's an actual Greek word that's used in the context of solving a mystery, okay? Don't know what's good. Now, all of a sudden, it's revealed. Oh, okay, that's it. That's the reason. That's the motive. That's why they did what they did. And so here's what Paul is saying. He says, I don't want you to pray like, God, get me a job. I need a job. Or, 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 or God, help me with my finances. Or, God, I pray that she likes me. Um, that's a start, Okay, that's a start, but he says, I want you to spend the time necessary because this is what you need to do instead of worry. You're taking away that time that's given over to those things. He said, I want you to spend the time necessary to understand for yourself what it is that you really want and then reveal that to God. Now, we're going to get a little deep weeds here, so kind of hang with me, all right? So in other words, on the surface, I pray, God, I desire a better job, okay? But what, is, what I'm saying is, what is the underlying desire? In all of that. Okay, what is the underlying desire? The underlying desire, well, I want to be able to do this for my family, or I want to be able to take care of this, or I want, you know, to have more significance, or to be known in a different way than I am now, okay? Uh, Father, I need, to, I need to sell my house, okay, but what's behind that? What, what is driving that request? In other words, don't just tell God what you want. It is okay to tell God what you want, but that's only a start. But I want you to reveal to God that deepest desire of your heart. That's what the solution is. So, so stick with me here. I think it begins to loosen up and bring to the surface our greatest fear. And the thing is, I, I don't do this. Very few of us pray at the level of our fear. We hardly ever say to God, God, I'm afraid this is going to happen. You know, we just say, well, God, I want, I want this other thing to happen. Most of us, very, very few of us pray at the level of our insecurity. Most of us pray at the level of, okay, here's what I want. Here's what I need. Uh, bless all the missionaries. Amen. <laughs> you know, that, that, that can be the level that we pray at. So Paul's saying, feel free to pray that way if you want, but that's not going to help you with what your issue is. You can go through the motions, but that's not going to help you with the real issue. And, and, and when you're feeling uncertain and you're not sure what to do next and what to do, and you're having doubts maybe you've never had before, he says, here's how I want you to pray. He said, I want you to say, God, here's my petition. Here's my prayer. Here's what I want. But here's why I'm afraid of, of not getting that. Here's, why I'm, here's my deepest desire here. Here's, my, here's what I fear is going to happen. And that's my real heart's desire. And Paul says, I want you to pray. I want you to petition. I want you to be grateful. He says, but I want you to reveal, to be open okay, to allow your inner desires to be discovered or you give them to God, right? Um, and, and here's what I wrote in my notes this morning. I wrote, uncertainty brings to the surface my deepest insecurity and my hidden values. In other words, those are the things that I really want. Those are the things. And when I move past, help me find a job. When I move past, help me sell the house. When I move past, help me find that one. When I move past that, what is behind all of those legitimate requests comes to the surface. And that's things like my security and my concern for my family and my need to feel important and my need to be viewed in a certain way by the people around me, my need to be viewed in a certain way or respected in a certain way by my, by my kids or, or my parents. And my fear is that perhaps God doesn't know that. And so Paul says, I want you to dig this stuff up. That's why I said this, this is a little bit tougher for us, a little bit more than just a surface level kind of message. He said, I want you to dig it out and I want you to come to God and I want you to spend the time until you begin to understand 
what's your deepest, darkest bottom line, what that deep fear is, what that deep desire is. He says, and when you get it, I want you to bring it and present it to your heavenly father here. This is yours. This is yours. Philippians 4, 7 gives us an amazing promise. It talks about the peace of God, not the peace of circumstances. We've all had that. Every one of us have had a place in our life where we thought everyone came home safe tonight. Um, we had our meal on time. We all went to bed on time. There's peace. We all understand that kind of peace. But he says there's another kind of peace. And he says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Remember at the very beginning, we rejoiced in the Lord. Okay, at the end here, he says, at the end of this process, you will understand the peace that God had. You'll understand that in the Lord, in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the bottom line. This is kind of cool. Forget Greek. Go back to English. Guard. Everybody knows what guard does. Guard stands watch, right? Guard stands watch and protects. We want someone to guard us. We want to be safe. Something like this. So, what if... We have not invited our Heavenly Father to stand guard over our heart and mind. Now, I've invited Him to stand guard over my family. I pray for my, I get up this morning, I get up early, and I just kind of go down through the list. <laughs> you know, this kid and this kid and this kid. I got to remember who just had a grandkid and who did that. And um, if I can't get back to sleep, I start with you guys, believe it or not. And I, I try and think of where people sit, and I kind of go through the auditorium and, and just pray. But, but I want to go beyond that, okay? He says that we pray that God will guard our hearts, the real us, that, where that desire is, where that thing that needs to be revealed is, and our minds, okay, that he will stand guard over that. And, and, you know, it's almost like Paul said, you know, when you get to the end of this, what if I could teach you how to allow God to stand guard over your heart and mind? Would that be amazing? I mean, would we, would we worry about things as much as we do if we know, oh, God's got this. I don't have to do this. So I love that song. Brian and I, it's funny. Every once in a while, we'll get together and, and we'll say, okay, we need this song for this message and this song for this message. Uh, this past week, he said, we're doing a new song. I said, okay. And the words of that last song is, is, is exactly what I'm talking about here, okay? Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole lot of things I can't do at my best, and those are the things that we, we tend to hang on to, and, and we fear that I can't do this. I, you know, and it takes away our, our livelihood. It takes away our security. It takes away our significance. But that last line of the song said, but God can. But God can. And, and, and I think that's why you know, people say, well, you know, why, why do we repeat songs sometimes? I think we need to hear that over and over. But God can. And, and, and so what if I could allow... Myself to have peace in the midst of uncertain times. And what if, what if I could have peace in the midst of this uncertainty? And what if instead of being stressed out in those high moments of, of stress, what if I could learn to pray in the meantime in such a way that at the end of my prayer I would go, it's okay. Not I'm going to pray and then I'm going to keep on, you know, being anxious about it. So what Paul's saying is in time of uncertainty we're to pray until the peace comes. That in times of uncertainty we're to learn to pray until that peace comes. Notice I didn't say pray until the situation changes. Paul's situation didn't change. In fact, it got worse. I didn't say pray until the circumstances change. And this is huge because we have the opportunity and God has promised us that there is a point where we can pray until the peace comes. And we pray until the peace comes, not when we simply pray out our request, God, I want, God, I need, God, give me, God, bless me. But God, here's what I want, and here's why I'm afraid will happen if I don't get it. Here's what I'm afraid will happen, all right? When you pray like that, here's what you can do. You can go out into the same world. You can go out into the same circumstances that you entered into this prayer in. But now you have something you didn't have before, and that's the peace of God. Peace of God is an amazing thing. I'd love to, to teach on it. Maybe we'll, something we'll do later this year. Um, the Bible talks several times about a peace that passes understanding. And, and all of you have known people, in particular believers, who have gone through some awful rough times, and yet when you see them, you wouldn't know it because of their, their, their attitude and, and the way they react and act. And you go, 
Wow, that's the peace. Like I said, we get a peace that the world understands. We get that, but a peace that passes understanding. And Jesus says, and excuse me, Paul says that's something you can have. So we're going to come back to that probably later this year. I love what C.S. Lewis said, great writer. Uh, he said this, he said, prayer is not about changing God. Prayer is about changing me. God doesn't change when we pray. Okay, he doesn't say, oh, I didn't know he needed that. Okay, he already knows our needs. Prayer is about changing me. And, and, and that happens when I can be open and reveal myself. So here's your homework. You do it real quick, all right? You don't need to write this down. You can remember this, I guarantee you. We'll pop it up on the screen. So here's how, go home today, tonight, whatever, when you, when you have your prayer time. Heavenly Father, I need you to blank. Fix this, solve this, you know, whatever it is. Heavenly Father, that's where our prayers start. So whatever it is, and, and don't be afraid to pray, all right? But here's where it starts, it gets interesting. Heavenly Father, I need you to blank. Because if you don't, I'm afraid of this. If you don't, I'm afraid of this. You see what you've done? You've opened up something, haven't you? You've revealed something. You've presented something. Uh, I wrote in my notes, some of you are afraid to admit you're afraid. All right? Some of you are so insecure about some things that you have blanked out to the fact that you're insecure about some things. You just think it's normal life. Heavenly Father, I need you to blank, because if you don't, I'm afraid blank, all right? Heavenly Father, I need you to, and begin with your greatest anxiety. Begin with whatever it is that you're most stressed out about right now. You may have 38 stress things, <laughs> you know, 47 things you're worried. Start with the one that's the most, all right? Start with the one that when you're just sitting around during the day, your mind just goes there. Your mind just goes there, whether it's your, your money, your kids, your health, whatever, relationship, your job, whatever it is, start there. And then, God, I'm afraid that if you don't come through, I just don't know what's going to happen. I just don't know what's going to happen. And I'm telling you that the peace of God is available to people who will say, I don't know, but God, you do, and I'm just going to trust you. Just going to trust you. And... I'm, going to, I'm seeking that peace that passes all understanding. But if you, if you do that, the peace of God's available. I wrote this, the peace of God's available to those people who will allow their Heavenly Father to take them to that level of conversation and honesty with their God in heaven. It's certainly not a surface thing. Well, i got to pray, so I'll pray my memorized prayer. It's getting somewhere and getting serious with God. When you do that, you'll find that peace. And you'll find that you can always trust Him. Always trust God. And by the way, knowing that you can always trust God is where your hope comes from. Where your hope comes from. We're going to talk about hope next week, all right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. For each one that's here, we have uh, some new folks and a lot of probably folks listening online. I pray that you would uh, just open up our hearts and minds to this truth, that we'll think about it, that we'll not just kind of pass it off and say, well, not that important. This is important because this is the level that we all struggle with. Uh, especially as believers, when we know that God will come through, but he's not right now. And so what do we do in the meantime? How are we supposed to live? Thankful Paul wrote this down and wrote this letter, and it has been preserved for us. It's been saved for us and protected so that we could have it. Uh, we're thankful for Jesus today. We pray this in his name. Everybody said, amen. amen.